Is there a way that you can change your own views, your own emotions, so that you have better relationships with everyone around you and feel better about yourself? That's what we'll talk about today. Everything we hear is an opinion, not fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not the truth. Marcus Aurelius. Today, we're going to talk about the book, People Can't Drive You Crazy If You Don't Give Them the Keys, by Dr. Mike Bechtel. Last time we talked about what can we do about other people who add drama into our lives and how can we better deal with them. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about how we can deal with ourselves so that we're more prepared to deal with other people who may be driving us crazy, maybe giving us drama, but how can we handle things better? He says that a big question we always think about is why can't people be more like me? Wouldn't the world be better if it was all about me? And I think it's a false belief. Someone at my work was joking about cloning me. And I said, well, as long as they don't all live with me. And that's the point. Even if you had clones of yourself that reacted exactly how you would react, it wouldn't be a great situation. It doesn't make us grow. It doesn't make us have better times because we need to have people who are not like us. That's where the true relationships go. But when we have those people who are not like us, we demand they be like us, even though we realize that that will make the relationship in a lot of ways worse. But the point you have to realize is that we are all unique human beings. We all have unique DNA. We all have unique situations that we grew up in. Even if the other people in our lives are our siblings, no one is going to be exactly like us, no matter how much we demand that they like us. And that we are different. What he says by design, we're meant to be different. We are different. And there's no changing that. And so as much as these other people make us upset or add drama into our lives, the best thing that we can do is to really heal ourselves for those things that are hurtful to us so that we can be stronger, more courageous people. When we fix ourselves, we'll be more emotionally sound in every situation and every relationship we've ever been in. And we start off by doing that by, first of all, recognizing and even celebrating that the fact that everybody's different. They come from a different place than we come from. They have different views than we come from. And that diversity is a strength. We need everybody. And that makes the world a better place when we have people who disagree with us. If you look at any particular aspect of politics or differences of opinion, the other side makes us better makes us stronger by challenging our beliefs and looking at things in a different way. And once we realize that that's a strength of ours, it will make the world better. It'll make us better too. And then we have to allow people to work in those areas of strengths that they do have. If someone is particularly good at a thing, even if we disagree with them, but they're great at it, we need to let them work in that space. They will make that thing better. And then we can look at ways of even making them even better in that space. Maybe it's more training. Maybe it's more resources. But how can we make people, even if we disagree with them, better at the thing that they are really good at? And he says some responses that when someone is adding drama to your life or saying something you don't agree with, maybe they're not adding drama, but you feel that way because you disagree. He says things like, OK, I'm listening. I'm with you. You're making some really interesting points, and I need to take some time to think about what you've said before I respond. You deserve a thoughtful response, and I want to do that. I'm going to jot down some ideas, and I'm going to send them to you in an email. Then let's talk again. Some calm ways that we can go about disagreeing with someone, not in a disagreeable way. And he says that when we respond in that calm way, we are coming back in a position of strength not in a position of weakness or revenge or anger or just a smack back at somebody. We are actually coming at them with reason and calmness. He says that we have to look at temperament differently than behaviors. So someone may behave poorly, but their temperament may not be representative in how they're actually behaving. They may actually have some good points, but their reaction to how they're treating you 
is maybe not the most appropriate way to do it. And we have to really separate out how someone is talking to us versus what they're saying to us or the message they're trying to get back to us. It's really important that we try to understand them accurately, correctly, instead of trying to just say, well, they said it in a very angry way or they spoke to me in an inappropriate way and really listen to what it is they're saying. I had a family member talk to me once in a way that was just completely unacceptable. I was worried about her finances. She was spending money in a way that was going to damage her long-term health. And so I talked to her a little bit about it. I suggested that maybe I could take over her finances and help her do a little bit better. And she reacted in a very brutal way, came back and accused me of wanting all her inheritance, yelled at me, and hung up the phone, didn't speak to me for six months. I was really trying to do what was best for her so that she could live a happy life for the next 40, 50 years. But what she heard was someone trying to take away her control. I think I could have been better at how I said it. I certainly tried to be better about how I said it. But in the end, I got a very negative, angry reaction to her. Her behavior was completely unacceptable. And again, she didn't speak to me for six months, even though I tried my hardest to be as calm and kind as I could. But what she was saying is that she's scared. She's scared that I was going to use her. And in the end, it probably wasn't even that. She was scared that I was going to say no to many things that she wanted someone to say yes to. Can I go on this expensive vacation? Yes. Can I buy this expensive thing? Yes. And she knew that if I were to take over her finances, the answer would most likely be no all the time or at least most of the time. And so her reaction to me was out of fear of losing control, of losing the things that she really wanted to do in her life. So you have to take out the core content of what she believed I was saying, what she believed the end results were going to be versus how she behaved towards me. When she called me six months later and apologized, the answer was, yes, of course I'll accept your apology. I understand this is a really scary time. It took every ounce of my being to say that because I was hurt and mad. But you know what? The relationship was more important than her behavior at that moment. And it's hard because we think we have to cut off our beliefs. We have to cut off what we're feeling, our emotions. We have to deny our own hurts in order to make that relationship work. But instead, what you can realize is that person's behavior came from a place that they couldn't help either, that they weren't trying to hit out you. They're not an evil person. The clapback that she did to me wasn't in a place where she was trying to be cruel to me, even though in the end, I think it was cruel. I realized that she was trying as a fighting mechanism to protect the things that she wanted. And so it's hard. I'm not saying that, oh, just have all of these very zen and calm. It's not that easy. It wasn't that easy for me. I spent six months being very hurt by this person and stewing about the situation. But when it came down to it, I realized that the relationship was more important to me than being right, than getting revenge or ending the relationship and just saying, sorry. I can't deal with you. So what we have to realize, he says, is there's a difference between our reaction and our response. The reaction is how I felt. I was hurt. That was my reaction. I was angry. That was my reaction. I was just trying to help. I was indignant about it. There's my reaction. But the response is actually what he says we do. And that's the part where we actually come back to that other person. And so that's the difference, is instead of automatically reacting, we decide another path. We decide to find a different way to respond to the person instead of reacting to the person. And he's saying that we don't ignore our emotions. We don't ignore the feelings. We've all known times where we've been upset at someone. We yelled immediately the first thing that came to our mind, and then we spent years or decades wishing we could have taken it back. It's not about pushing your emotions away. It's not about 
making sure that you deny yourself and that you don't feel anything about it. The question is, is can you find a healthier way to respond, gain some strength in our emotions so that we respond better and not say the thing that we're going to regret that we said? He says that the best thing that we can do is learn how to manage our emotions and manage what we're thinking about things and give it a little bit of time so that we can calm down and not immediately hit back at somebody. So he says that we should pay attention to what happened, pay attention to what our thoughts are, realize that we can control our thoughts. I know people think that what we react and how we react is exactly what it is, and we can't change it, but we can change our thoughts. When we become masters of our emotions and masters of our thinking, then we can choose our thoughts about the situation. And then we stop becoming a victim. I could spend my time thinking about how this person hit back at me and my emotions about it. Or I can think this is a very scared and hurt person. And she did the best that she could in that moment. I don't have to be a victim from her. I don't have to be a victim of my own thoughts or my own emotions. I can acknowledge them and decide to think about this differently. The question is now, can we look through a lens of a more accurate situation, fully giving ourselves perspective about a situation, and then choosing how we're going to respond? We realize, again, we're unique. They're unique. What we've learned in our lives is what causes us to react in certain ways. But the way that they learned in their lives also caused them to react in this way. This person in my life was treated like a child, by her own parents all the way through her entire adulthood. So as soon as someone comes to her and says, let me take care of your finances for you, it's just one more time when someone treats her like a child. It wasn't the right response, I think. And once we do get control of our thinking and get control of our emotional response, we're now free. We're free from any other human being. We're free from situations that try to beat us over the head about it. And now we're free to actually react to people in a better way, too. And I learned this a long time ago from Wayne Dyer, who said that people can push our buttons and we can decide that our buttons will not be pushed. We can change the way we react to people and deny them that ability to push our buttons. And most people don't realize that. They think you acted, I reacted. I reacted back and that we're almost like robots, unable to control our emotions, unable to control our responses. But that's not true. And once we get that moment where we realize that we are in control of our thoughts, we're in control of our responses, suddenly we have achieved a different emotional response from it. And we have to change from that inside out. We can't just change our response without changing our thinking about it. We'll just drive ourselves crazy too. We'll make ourselves upset. We will stew in our own anger. And that's where people talk about how they swallow their emotions. But if we really learn how to alter what we think about a situation and honestly change that situation, we'll be better for it. He says how we get there is through humility, joy, perspective, patience, kindness, having integrity about the situation, and commitment. I think that last one was the real key to all the situations. We don't live in a world where we're committed to anything or anyone anymore. We get divorces, we break up with friends, we smack people around on the internet and refuse to talk to them and then block them because now they've made us mad. But when we become committed to a relationship, This is not going to go away. I'm not going to rage quit this relationship. I'm not going to storm out of the room. That's where the honest growth happens because now we're stuck in the same boat together. It says in the end that we're supposed to love people and even the ones that make us crazy, add drama to our lives, or intentionally or unintentionally hurt us. It really puts us in a bad situation when we have a relationship with someone who continuously hurts us. And so that's where he talks about not giving up and having that commitment and perspective and growing emotionally to where we can take charge of that relationship. So in order for any of this to happen, he says that we have to have 
a perspective on truth, because it's hard to say what exactly is true. And that means what we have to kind of look outside ourselves and look outside our own perceptions of something and realize, too, that other people are not accountable to us. We are not their parents. We are not the rulers of other people. And if we think we can change people, we're just not going to be able to do it. So we have to realize that we have no power to change other people. We can change how we look at a particular situation, that we can change the emotional reaction we have to other people. And once we do, he says that we'll see rainbows in our mud puddles. We can yell about the rainy day, but then we realize the rainy day is what makes all the green, all the flowers, all the good things that we enjoy outside happen. It's a change of perspective. And there's always that statement, right? There's three things. There's your truth, my truth, and the real truth. And the problem is, is that that's true. We all have different perspective of what truth is. And once we gain a little bit of perspective on it, maybe we'll be less emotional about it or be able to respond in a little bit better way. Once we have a more realistic view that while something is true to me, it may not be true, true, and it may not certainly be true to that other person. That perspective will help us grow. He says that it's important for us to not sweat the wrong stuff. And that means that if we think someone's wrong out there, we don't get so wigged out about it. Why does that other person feel like they can't let you be wrong? Even if they think you're wrong about something, why can't they just let it be? Why can't they let go of it? Why is it so important to them that you're not wrong? And why is it so important to you that they're not wrong? We can let people be wrong. It's okay. We can allow someone to have a different opinion from something, even if we think they're wrong. And so then in the end, it's about finding what the right battles are. I decided long ago I wasn't going to argue about politics. It's not where I plant my flag. I have strong opinions about things. I want to have conversations about other things. I don't want to fight about politics. I don't want to get upset about politics or other things. There are other issues in my life I find more important and more important for me to follow through with. If we sit there and we take this nuclear option with other people on every topic, every political topic, every pandemic topic, every topic we see on the planet, whether it's regards to the color of the sky or the quality of the dinner, we're going to live a really ragged and tiring life. And instead, just stop getting upset about the wrong things and start getting invested in the right things, in the right conversations. And so for me, I decided that there are places where I am willing to fight tooth and nail about it. But it's really on one particular topic. Everything else happens in my life. I'm not going to fight with people about it. I'm not going to argue with them. I'm going to let them have their opinion. And that's fine. It is okay for other people to disagree with us. And it's important for us to realize that we have to pick our battles. We will have a realm of influence on only so many things in another person's life. And if we start picking every battle out there, when something comes down to it that's really important, we won't have that ability anymore to have that deep conversation because we're reactionary to everything. Everything makes us upset. Everything makes us debate them. And now we've lost any ability to have an important conversation about what really matters. And so he says that we can choose not to worry. We can focus on things that are positive instead of trying to control other emotions. And we can instead focus on our own emotions. When I see people who disagree with me, even on politics or things that are important of how our society works, I realize that their point of view is important. Maybe I'm not focused on that thing. Maybe they're focused on something else, but we both have really good points and both of our views makes our society better. And he says that we can try to be connoisseurs of the truth, try to do better when parsing out true things, not true things, even about ourselves, looking at our own points of view and seeing if they're accurate or seeing if we have some blind sides. Maybe we're in our own bubble. We can choose how to react physically, emotionally with other people and realize that we can't fix everything. 
We have to become the master of our moods. He says, what can I control? Me, my choices, and my attitudes, and everything else I can't control. He says it's important, too, that we just don't try to rush this growth. We don't try to shove ourselves into this emotional mastery, this thinking mastery. It takes time. It's hard to do. And if we can get there, we'll have to take the time to invest in actually getting there. He asks us to live with a view of things in kindness, that when we look at kindness towards other people, we look at everything about them through that lens of kindness, that we try to build trust, that we try to show them that we are on their side, even if we disagree. And I don't think kindness is a big trait anymore. But what we can decide to do is that we can decide to be kind. And it really is important that we treat each other better. And if someone asks the question, do I have to be kind to jerks or kind to people who are making drama in my life? And the question is that if we look at kindness correctly, meaning that even in tough relationships, we're going to look at things through the kindest filter ever, then yeah, that means that we're not even getting to that point where we're angry or instantaneously reacting. We're instead thinking about kindness and treating people through that lens. It's not that we're tamping down our abilities or our feelings to react to people. We're actually looking at people in a different light. He says it means, too, that we have integrity. That means that we have to be honest with ourselves, trusted by other people, and honest with other people. As soon as we start lying or playing psychological tricks to get our way, then we've lost our integrity. If we stand on our integrity all the time, we'll be able to stand up to people, even those we dislike, and people will understand that we're always a straight shooter, that we always have honesty on our side, even through a filter of kindness, but we're honest and we have integrity in the relationship. And people will come to trust that. He says that if we try to fake integrity, it may feel good. It may feel like we're trying to do the right thing, but people will be able to see through it. And he says that the payoff is in the long run. Maybe we're not going to change those relationships that add drama in our lives right away. We're not going to be an influence automatically, but we will if we stick to these principles of integrity, kindness, seeking truth, and changing our emotional and our thought ways. If we persist in that, We'll get to the place where people will actually see us for what we are. And he says that the way that we'll get there is, first of all, by building up those relationships that provide us a lot of emotional stability. Who offers kindness to us? If we're always in this battle mode all the time, it'll be hard to live. But having those close relationships that give us kindness and give us comfort will help us be strong in these other times. And he calls this the prescription of progress is that we first of all have to have that honest perspective. We have to value, he says, tiny steps. That means in ourselves that when we accomplish something, we have to realize that it's hard. And even a small step in the right direction is productive. But it's also the small steps in the other people. So if you have an uncle who's just yelling and causing drama all the time, and there's one time you got together and you had a great conversation, no drama, no yelling, it's a tiny step. And how you react to that tiny step through reinforcement, through, hey, that was wonderful. I had a great time this afternoon. And and celebrate the fact that you made progress together in your relationship. It will help make sure that there's relationship in the future that has more of that. So it's not a wasted effort, even if it's a very small step on the part of you or on the part of the other person. He says that it's important that we don't stay in the middle of the road. That's where the roadkill is, right? We don't get anywhere if we decide that we're going to avoid pain, we're going to swallow our own selves, and we avoid situations that add drama to our life. We still have to tackle those issues, but again, we have to tackle them in such a way that it makes progress and that we have an expectancy and a hope that it could change, but that it might not change either. And then the last step, he says, is that we have to be able to live in the present. If we dredge up all the hurts and all the angers of the past, 
we're just going to be continually angry and hurt all the time. But if we can live in the present, this person that spoke hurtfully to me in the past is still in my life and we have a better relationship. Could have ended that day when she made all those accusations against me. But instead, we were able to get past it and I think improved because of it. So if we live in the present and not dredge up the past, we'll be happier too. And he said that the goal or the reward of all this healthy thinking is that, first of all, people will like us better and we'll like ourselves better. We'll understand that our emotions are more honest and genuine and real if we become masters of our emotion and we'll get better perspective about it. We won't walk around as victims. We won't walk around as rage monsters all the time. Instead, we'll be this very central, cool individual who can get out of situations easily without having that anger response. He says as his very last point that if nothing else is working and there's no reconciliation that we can get out of a situation, to get help to see if there's some sort of counseling that can help bring you back together again, or at least come up with terms of the relationship that every side can agree with. So my challenge to you is to see which situation can you change about yourself? Is there an assumption you're making about someone in your life that maybe isn't correct? Or maybe you're putting yourself in the best situation and that other person in a worse situation. They're the devil. I'm the angel. And see if some thinking about that relationship couldn't change some of the drama involved and take it down so where you can get together and find calm and peace inside your relationship. And now our fun entertainment advice of the week comes from Gilmore Girls. I've had enough of this. I'm going back out to touch up my moves. I have some work to do. Fine, I have to go anyhow. Hey! This is not gonna happen. You're not going back out to your moonscape. You're not going back to work and you're not going home. Now we all agreed to have Friday night dinner and we're here and I smell dinner. And yes, apparently there are some issues to be worked out, but no one, I mean no one, is leaving here until we do. Nobody knows how to fight like that family, but you know what? They also know how to make up and how to come back together. And Lorelai, she figured out, this is what we do. We get together and we made this commitment to each other. They've had some pretty rough times, but they always come back to being a family. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you being out there. If you have anything to say to me, you can email me at jill at smallstepspod.com. And remember that change begins with you. It's the only thing you can change. And you can do that change in small steps. 